Okay, <clears throat> we thank you, Heavenly Father, for allowing us to meet here this evening. Please open up our minds and our hearts to the law, because all of this law is your law. We ask this through your Son, Yahushua. Amen. Do we have any announcements this evening? Okay, then come on up and announce. Hmm. I get to be the announcer, huh? My name is Don, and I was spending some time in the library this afternoon, and I found some things, and I thought the people here and out in the audience might like to know about. I was uh, reading through Section 53 of the Ohio Revised Code, which has to do with real estate condominiums. I think uh, 5309 and 5310 of that code are have to do with registrations of real estate. And one of the things here is uh, you might want to jot down is 5301.13. That's the mode of conveyance uh, by the state. Section 5301.14 is. Uh, copy of the record of a lost deed to be evidenced 5301.15 the governor may execute a new deed to supply lost conveyance 5301.17 new deed from state to correct errors and that one says when satisfactory evidence is apparent to the governor or the attorney general that a deed, that an error has occurred, occurred in a deed executed and delivered in the name of the state or the certification of any public officer upon which, if correct, a conveyance would be required from the state or the, gover the governor shall correct such error by execution of a correct title deed accounting to the int according to the intent and object of the original purchaser or conveyance to a party entitled to it his heirs or legal assigns and take from such party a release of the state to the state of the property erroneously conveyed in, in essence, what I think this thing is saying to us is uh, for those of us who have paid for our property and you go about the right, citing the right codes to them, the original intent of that property or the registration was not to hand over your property to the state. So this is a way of correcting that error. In section 53, 11.19, it says, release a mortgage to state. When lands or tenements are mortgaged to the state to secure payment of money to the state, and the money so secured together with the legal, legal intention, intention due there is paid to the state or other person authorized to receive it, the governor shall sign and deliver to mortgagee, mortgager, his heirs assigns a deed of release of real estate, real estate sold mortgage. Section 530120. These are all right, right in, in a matter. This, this whole section is only probably about 40 or 50 pages long, but the codes are bingo. They're right there in order. Here's the, another one that has a lot of Relevance. It's 5301.20. Reversion of owner to a land conveyed to state. When a copy of lands or tenements made to the state contains the condition that the real estate so conveyed to the state recent to recent to greater or payment of certain sums of money or on performance of other conditions and money with legal intent thereon from the time it was 
by the time that it was due or payable, is paid to the to the treasurer of the state or other person author to re- authorized to receive it or to some conditions started in oh or to other conditions stated in such deeds are performed according to the stipulation contained therein on the receiving certificate from the proper officer of payment or other performances. The governor shall execute and deliver to the grantor his heirs assigns a deed of release for the property so conveyed. And then underneath that it says the trans uh When the transfer has been a foreclosure of, of equity of redemption for non-performance of the condition stated in any such deed of, con- of conveyance, this section and sections uh, 530.119 are inoperative as such case. In, in any relevance, if you want to get into this, this is all in section 53, which is a real estate in Ohio uh, Revised code, and in this section 53, I'm sure if we have it here, you've got to have some kind of same code in your state, so it might be worth looking at it or going to the library and try and get a cross reference on this. Maybe you can get your property back <coughs> up, down under, or out from under. This is Joe Sherry. Uh, I've got two <coughs> two items here. Um, a lot of you haven't seen me since Victoria's workshop. That's because my boss had me scheduled for Monday nights. Today he had me off. Good. Um, I want to let you know that um, the audio tapes uh, are ready. I've got uh, two sets for a couple people who I don't see here tonight. The videos I've been holding out uh, in hopes of getting some more orders for. Uh, if anybody is interested in those videos, let me know tonight because I've got to start processing them. Um, okay, the, uh, the cost for the, vid, uh, for the audios for those who attended the workshop are $50. For those who did not, it's $70. Uh, the videos for those who attended is $160. For those who did not, it's $200. So let me know. Uh, next it, Next issue, next item. Um, I need some help in, from anybody who can help me trace a bad check. Uh, I got a bad check. Actually, my boss got a bad check, and he's looking at me to fix it. <laughs> I took a bad check from one of his customers unknowingly. And I says, well, so he says, here, you go see if you can collect it. Okay. I'm not sure how to go about that. Uh, this person was in a hotel, gave me a check that looked to be a starter check. There was no printed name or address on it. I'm not sure where to, where to go from there. Uh, the bank has returned it for non-sufficient funds. So anybody who has any info, um, let me know. Come see me. Okay, any more announcements? <coughs> Okay, again, I'll announce that Victoria Joy has still got several seminars scheduled down the road here. One is in Daytona Beach, Florida on October 3rd through 5th. One is in San Francisco, California, October 24th through 26th. One in San Antonio, Texas, November 7th through 9th. You can get more information on this by going to a website, www.angelwiththe.com. Inkwell.org. No spaces between any of the words, all in lowercase. Uh, you should get information there on who the host is going to be at those appropriate um, seminars, and you can contact them then for specific information. Uh, Victoria was in Massachusetts, Boston here this past weekend. I um, heard that she made it there. I have not heard from her today since she did the seminar, so we'll see where that's going. From someone from the West Coast, she was flying in there on Thursday, 
And when she called me before she took off, she was very concerned about going through the hurricane. And I told her as long as it was to Boston and on Thursday it preceded any of the hurricane, extensive weather being that far north, the hurricane was going to pass between Ohio and there, so I don't think they had any problems, but maybe got a lot of rain. Cleveland got a, what, about an inch and a half, two, depends on where you were in Cleveland. So, Okay, no more announcements. A um, couple of things. Every now and then, Caleb and I get some email and feedback from people that comes across uh, from some of our our um, Monday night classes, and uh, many of the times it's just private information, sometimes it's normal bitching or whatever goes on from everybody, no two people are all going to agree to anything and that's fine and dandy, but every now and then something comes across and it's kind of interesting. Um, this one was a feedback that got forwarded on to me from having gone through several sources. Somebody came up and they had emailed someone and basically said, in the New Jack Smith tapes, now these are actually old tapes by now, this was back in June, uh, he explained something we have all missed over the years and why we are losing in the court system. In an equity court, it is presumptions and the court can see no facts nor evidence, I believe, it is the way he said. The key is to turn your case into a, quote, at law, unquote, uh, so that the court can see the facts and evidence. It can flip-flop back and forth and get us in a lot of trouble. This needs to be taken right down into the ground and studied more than we have ever studied before, this person writes. I know now why a certain judge in a federal court case of U.S. versus some patriots said to the patriot, I can't see your evidence. This party says I was in an equity court tribunal, not in law. Equity courts can see no case sites, no evidence. It'll, it's all presumptions that the United States was correct. I could not rebut their presumptions. What a trap. Get a copy of Jack Smith's June 9th tapes. We will probably have a lot of people out there now asking for those, unless they already got them, which they probably do. Otherwise, they wouldn't know where to write anyway. And he goes over it with a Winston letter, I think his name is. And then they said, you know Winston Shrout. The tape is in my car. I'm going to transcribe it and then put it out to you. Let's really study this. It is why we have been failing, all of us, in the court. If we win, it's by pure accident or embarrassment on the court. Also, in an equity court setting, the judge cannot issue findings of fact and conclusion of law because there is no law in an equity court. I was dumbfounded when I heard this tape and Winston's remarks. Is this the guy who spoke in Spokane, meaning Winston, when such and such had to leave early um, on a particular time. Now, this guy responds in, and says the following. Forget about Jack Smith's tapes. It's all old news, period. Out with the old and in with the new, I say. One, there are no in-law courts in existence today, period. Two, every so-called state court rules clearly state at Rule 2 that they have combined law and equity into one form of action called a civil action period. Three, all so-called state courts have federal tax ID numbers. And our federal courts, in fact, in law, and therefore can lawfully proceed in rem, which is admiralty. Four, all courts in the land today are legislatively created courts, created by statutes, and therefore are administrative agencies and have only the jurisdictions sub subscribed or prescribed by statute over any given issue, period. Five, pick up a copy of Westlaw or Lexus, publish state federal court rules, and stop buying into patriot mumbo-jumbo from right-way law. So there you go. I guess we can all go home now. Okay? Um, 
The only reason I wanted to comment on this is because it comes into a class of these kinds of things where in reality someone that has been progressing along with what we've been looking at and describing for weeks and weeks and months and months on end and have got a pattern of having had a foundation behind what it is we're discussing all of a sudden gets excited because they see some light and truth that's emerged over a period of time and they right away want to go out and start preaching to all their buddies and friends what's going on and let them see the light too. But scripture says that there are people that see and do not see and hear and do not hear. Now, in reality, both parties in that discussion were absolutely correct. I would never dispute any facts from the guy who wrote the five specific rebuttal facts. They're all true. However, he has absolutely no clue in understanding what it is that we really said in those June tapes because he probably never heard them and probably was not going to hear them because he already knows what's going on and he doesn't have to get any more facts to understand what his position is. And so this is typical of the patriot community and it's typical of the way people go into courts when they get a little knowledge and try to do things and they're totally off point. Remember, at no time, I don't believe if anybody goes back to that June tapes, am I ever going to say that, quote, common law courts exist in the land. Because the facts that the respondent put out here are absolutely true. There are no in-law courts in existence today, period. And every so-called state court rule says that law and equity are combined into one form of action called civil action. Well, a civil action is the public side of everything that's going on. There are no rules other than honor and dishonor for what's going on in the private side of any action. So if he says, oh, I looked at the rules, and therefore by looking at the rules, I know that Smith's crazy. Fine. No problemo. I have no problem with that at all. Now, it says, though, and he admits that law and equity are combined. Well, if they're combined, does that mean there is no law? Or does that mean there is no equity? Or that you've generated something new called law and equity, which is neither law nor equity. But it's something brand new. Does it say that law and equity have been combined into one form of action, but we're only going to be in an equity court, therefore you can't get a remedy at law, even though we're not a law court? doesn't say that. And that's the point that we were making. That if you go into the public side of the tribunals, they're going to be a combination of law and equity. And they're going to prevail to equity unless you do something to steer the principles of law in that equity court into their decision. So when we were talking that, hello, when a judge is coming out and the judge is saying, I can't see your evidence, there will be no findings of fact and conclusion of law, he's telling you flat out, I'm seeing only the equity side of your case because nothing else has been brought to my attention. And the point we're making is that patriots go into court acting like they're going to present claims in law. And the court can't hear the law claims when you put them in the form of law because the form only of law as a court of law is gone. So you have to purview the law form of the pleadings you want 
into a colorable pleading, which is really what the merger of law and equity is like, but you have to steer your evidence and steer the rest of what you're doing toward the law side to get a law remedy in a public equity administrative court, which is not going to all of a sudden change overnight and say, oh God, okay, we're now law. Although occasionally you see judges do strange things in their court. You see judges take down flags with fringes on them. You see judges take off their robes and sit at a table with the litigants. You see proceedings in chambers instead of in the courtroom. There are plenty of indications that these judges and these courts, which are established administratively and legislatively as admiralty maritime equity courts, have a law side to them if the pleadings are appropriate and colorable and if the parties make the right things appear to the court. And in order to make the right things appear to the court, it's got to be done privately before the public sessions. Because the public sessions are mere, uh, is really a mirror or an image of whatever it is that you've done privately before that public session came into being to steer that court in the direction that you're going. All courts in the land today are legislatively created courts. Absolutely true. All state courts have federal tax ID numbers. Absolutely true. There is no independent organic state courts left. And I think we probably saw that as a dying breath when the Supreme Court Justice in Louisiana couldn't even keep the monument to the Ten Commandments in his own building. And if the Supreme Court judge in Louisiana, under the Constitution of Louisiana, has no powers to purview what he will and will not keep in his court from the feds, then I guarantee you there are no state independent courts left at all. And he says, pick up a copy of Westlaw and Lexis and stop buying into patriot mumbo-jumbo from right-way law. I agree. Don't absorb any mumbo-jumbo from right-way law. Okay. End of my comment. Let those that have eyes to really see and ears to really hear know where they're coming from. In the same line, there is an article written in the November-December 2002 Jubilee. And this is an article written on page 7, and it's written by a gentleman. And he says in the article, Rendering unto Caesar what belongs to God. And here is another gentleman, with all due respect, probably has eyes to see and does not totally see, and ears to hear and does not totally hear, but that's my interpretation and it's not meant necessarily as a derivative to this person. Let him see what he sees and hear what he hears. He says in here, and the reason I want to bring this to our attention is because, again, anyone who listens to what we've been teaching and saying can in a heartbeat misinterpret things. And I'll get to the point where you'll see that's kind of obvious. He says, something is very wrong with the church today. Question, what's his definition of a church? Doesn't give one. Now, you know you're talking with someone who doesn't really understand all of what's going on when they don't really kind of define their words because when it's general and generic, then isn't it assumptive and presumptive? And we've been telling people for months, including back to June when we talked about equity and law, that if you stay in assumption and presumption, you're in Disney World in the land of fiction. And there's no sense carrying on any further discussion with these people because 
anything means anything you want it to unless you've defined your terms. But he says there's something wrong with the church today. Now, I'm going to assume his definition of church is the group of people that are ordinarily in the 501k churches, which are the corporations, the incorporated churches. On the surface, everything appears fine. Isn't that true in most of those churches? Large and ornate church buildings are omnipresent. Well, there's where we pretty well know where he's going. If there's a building involved, undoubtedly today we're dealing with a corporation. Okay? More people verbalize Christian beliefs. Money for televangelists keeps pouring in. Sports celebrities, movie stars, and even politicians claim Christianity is a core conviction. So why do I say something is very wrong with the church, meaning the corporations, today? I say something is very wrong because the definition and central purpose of the church have become something counter to that of the church's historicity. So now you know where he's defining the church. He's saying the church isn't the church. Because if they're not under the principles, then they can't be who they're claiming to be. So then, he's not talking about the church. He's talking about the impersonators of a church. Okay. In the first place, instead of proclaiming the traditional message of redemption through Christ alone, today's churches bask in the new doctrine of inclusiveness. Okay, that's our first word in this article that's going to create some problems. Because what is the redemption process involved? In order to become a creditor, what do you have to do in the redemption process? You can't pay your debt, brother. There is no money. What do you have to do in the, in the redemption process? Acceptance. Okay? To the average mind, does acceptance and inclusiveness start sounding synonymous, possibly? It could. So when I read this article, I'm going, wait a minute. Here is someone that probably does not understand, and he's going to confuse some very important terms in terms of getting your remedy. See, this guy is worried that the, the church today is including everyone. And to him, that's terrible, wicked, bad, and awful. You can't have that homosexual preacher in there. That's way too much inclusiveness for us. What's happening to the church? You see where this guy's going to go? Now, the other side of the coin is, what is the remedy? Non-acceptance? That could be equated with what he is proposing. But we're looking at different issues here, so let's go on. One can be identified as a Christian while believing and practicing virtually anything. Most professing, professing Christians today seem to believe that tolerance is a godliest virtue of all. One must wonder where, why God even bothered to create hell because it seems hardly anyone will ever go there, according to all these people. Now, he's laid the foundation and it already contains the trap that he's going to fall into. What's the trap? 
well, acceptance is a key, but what's the problem with the trap that he's falling into? He, well, he's judging. Who's he judging? The members of the corporation. Doesn't he want to save the corporation? What's his problem? The corporation is already dead. How do you save a dead thing? When you define the church as being the dead corporation and they take on dead policies... And you're going to, to go against the inclusiveness of the policies of the dead institution. What's that got to do with the church? See, this guy is going to go into a war against 501 corporations for their policies. They aren't the church. And because he's going to war against the dead, he wants you to believe you should join him in a war to fight dead people. How does that gain you your remedy? Why is that dead institution the church? And certainly the people of that dead institution have the right to follow any policy that political religious dead institution wants to follow. And the government will compel it to follow certain policies. So why is going to war against a dead political institution judging others for their corporate religious beliefs going to create any resolution to their issue or yours. He goes, in the second place, it seems today, church believes that God has had a second incarnation. He now resides in government. Oh, now he's falling into the next trap. Since he's already going to go to war against the church, the 501c3 corporations, now he's got to go to war against the government which licensed the 501c3. How is that in harmony with Romans 13? And how is it in harmony with redemption? Go to acceptance and peace. See the problem we're having here? Now, the reason that this grabbed me is because when I read this other article, you know, that people never listen to what we're talking about but they certainly have an opinion without knowing the facts of what's going on. Now, how is it that these people are any different than the equity institutions which don't want to learn the truth? All they want to do is assume and presume they understand what's going on. They're totally unteachable. They don't have eyes that really see and they don't have ears that really hear. Now he says, God now resides in the government, i.e., government is God. We don't need God. Today's Christians seem to define the Trinity as Father, Son, and Holy Republican Party. One gets the impression that modern Christians believe G.W. Bush has already issued in the kingdom of heaven. Surely somewhere lambs and lions are sleeping together. Well, lambs and lions would be sleeping together if they understood the principles of redemption and getting out of the corporate structure. The church's preoccupation with tolerance and its infatuation with government put it at odds with Scripture and with U.S. history. That is a true fact when you define his church as being the 501c3 corporation because they are the government. They are not the church. In effect, it is rendered to Caesar what belongs to God. Well, the corporation is just collecting for Caesar what the members of the corporation donate. It is disconcerting and downright scary to see how gullible today Christians have become. 
you know, if this guy actually knew a Christian, he'd probably understand that his whole article is written backwards. It is also becoming clear how the nations of antiquity fell into tyranny and oppression. Yeah, because they went to corporate structures too. Their own churches led them into the devil's den. That Christians have traded faith in biblical and constitutional principles, there he goes again, assuming the Constitution was going to contribute anything to his liberty or well-being, for faith in partisan politics is what's wrong. That fact's absolutely true. And until the church repents of this idolatry, excuse me, until the people who think that they are in a church and find out they're not repent, it will never be made right. Typical articles written by people that are on the wrong side of the issue and backwards. Now, Scripture does not say that there should be an all-inclusiveness per se. It says that God's people will separate themselves from the people of this world, number one. But that does not mean they're at war with the people of this world because ambassadors of a foreign kingdom don't make war against the peoples and the nations that they happen to inhabit. You can accept a foreigner for his ideas as they apply to him. You don't accept the foreigners because you want to adopt their strange ideas for your activities. But the person that wrote this article believes that he's got to be a member of an association and a corporation. Therefore, he confuses the fact that the true sons and daughters of God understand his word and what he wants them to do for the concept of, okay, if you claim to be his sons and daughters, I've got to come in and I've got to correct everything you're doing because you're not acting like them. In the second case, he wants to correct everybody else until they assume the name. In the first case, you have enough insight and intelligence to understand what the Scripture tells you to do and not associate with people that don't follow that because they aren't the church irregardless of what they're calling themselves. And it's not your duty to take the pagans that call themselves Christians and convert them. You can teach them if they will listen. And if they will understand and learn and correct their ways, it will be great. But it's not your job to convert the pagans. Okay, there was an interesting movie out this weekend, again, called Underworld. It happened to be pretty well attended, which is very, very interesting, considering that just about every reviewer of movies absolutely detestinates this movie. And most of them got really upset when at the end of the movie it appears very likely that it set itself up for a sequel. And they're so upset about the movie itself, they don't ever want to even consider that anyone would think of a sequel. The movie Underworld deals with a very interesting concept. There are three groups or entities in the movie, in the story. One is vampires. And in fact, the heroine, the star of the movie, is one of the vampires. And because you're seeing the movie from the position of a vampire, and let me explain to you that only one 
time that I know of. In the whole story, does any vampire ever bite anyone in the neck? So it's not really a Hollywood movie about vampires feasting on people's blood by catching them in the dark alley in some evening and attacking them. This story, Underworld, is more like the movie Matrix brought to either a werewolf or vampire flick. And in fact, the lead characters of the vampires almost dress like the characters of Matrix. This story is more about the maintenance of the history of the uh, coven of vampires than it is about their practice of having to suck the bloods of humans. And the story is set up when our lead vampire woman happens to be walking in probably the subways of New York and the vampires have been in a condition for thousands of years of trying to hunt down the packs of werewolves to exterminate them entirely off the face of the earth. And so this story deals with the warfare that's going on between the vampires and the werewolves. And it just collaterally deals with the humans. In fact, it's so collateral that the vampires and the werewolves treat humans as being nothing more than stupid, ignorant entities that walk the face of the earth, i.e. ostriches with heads in their sand that don't have a clue of what's going on. And we all know, of course, that the humans are the food for the vampires and the werewolves, but we're more interested in the interrelation of the goings-on between these other two entities, werewolves and vampires, than we are about their relation to humans, except where it applies to one man. And at the beginning of the story, it appears as though several werewolves are tracking a human in the subway, and it does not escape the vampire woman's notice that she's located some werewolves. Hello, we're supposed to have wiped them out. And secondly, why are they tr appearing to track a human? Like, they could eat a human or something, but why track him? And so, there is a confrontation which ensues in warfare, mostly between the vampires and werewolves, and when the woman vampire takes this back to report to her boss at the vampire coven that it appears as though there are many werewolves out there again in the subways, we've got to track them down before they become a threat to the vampires, the head honcho of the vampires isn't too concerned. No, 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 you're probably imagining things. And then she says, and he... And it appears as though they're tracking a human. Why would they be doing that? And again, that makes no sense. You must have flipped. You're wrong. The bottom line in this story is that the werewolves and the vampires go back thousands of years. And in the beginning, there was one ancestor that had a lineage of descent by a genetic breakup, whereby that one ancestor provided a line of werewolves as descendants, a line of vampires as descendants, and humans as descendants. Excuse me. Is there anything in Scripture which comes close to any concept like that? Well, yeah, there's a trinity, but how about Abram, Isaac, Jacob, Christians, Jews, Muslims, all from one genetic background? 
it appears as you go farther in the story that the werewolf clan has a set of rules that all the members of the clan must abide by and never question. And likewise, the vampire clan or coven has a set of rules and they must unquestionably follow the rules and never question them. Now, we know humans have statutes. And they better follow the statutes and never question them, but they don't talk about humans. Furthermore, it's absolutely imperative that the members of the vampire clan never study their ancient history. It's not allowed. Don't understand where you came from, why, and the important things of yesteryears. You just get what you've got today by the orders from your boss and march with them. That's it. Okay? Would it surprise anyone to learn that 